You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So today we're going to do another drawing, because nobody reached out, of course. It's amazing that the first three giveaways or four giveaways or whatever, boom, automatic. This is like number five now. So we'll do that. And then one thing that I really wanted to do, I talked, I think, yesterday about... Um, how Aaron Rodgers, compared to Mitch Trubisky, maybe this was a couple of days ago, whatever, that Rodgers over the last four weeks, which is since the bye week, is the 30th best quarterback in football in Mitch Trubisky's top six or five or whatever. And that's troubling. And what dawned on me is this is actually a really, not, not just interesting, but important question. What is everybody doing since the bye? Not necessarily because of the bye, but I think the bigger problem is when we try to assess who people are, especially with me using PFF, what I'm doing a lot of the time is looking at the cumulative. And I think even worse for some people, especially people that don't have PFF, they're looking at what I've known throughout the course of the year, right? And I harped on this a while ago. People love this guy because he had one good game that one time and they think that makes him awesome. They don't realize he's been out there every single week, just isn't doing anything. I'm not just referring to Kumaro, just in general, that's a thing that happens. Because you don't just have constant information in front of you. So if the only information you have is from four weeks ago when somebody said he's really good, then you just carry that on. And sometimes it's beyond year one. Like, I think Corey Lindsley would be an example. It's not a very good example because Corey Lindsley is a good center. But nobody ever talks about Corey Lindsley. The only time anyone ca- talks about Corey Lindsley is when somebody goes, oh yeah, he's a good center. How do you know that? You're not watching him. Nobody's watching him. Nobody's paying attention to him. You know that because you heard last year or the year before or whatever that he's the best center in football, so it's just boom, that's it. He is the best center in football. You forget that guys fall off. Now, again, that's not the case with Lindsley. He's fine. He's a good center. I've got no problem with him. The only real issue is going to be the upcoming cost, and that's a separate issue. But the point is, no attention is being paid to where guys are at now. That is to say, some guys have gotten remarkably worse. And and the biggest problem with this is that four weeks is kind of a smaller sample size, so it's not really perfect. But I think it is important to remember that things do change. Look at Kenny Clark. If you look at Kenny Clark over the, uh, over the course of the year and take that in its full context, he's not really that great of a defensive tackle. If you look at him over the last four weeks, which we're going to talk about today, you could argue he's the best defensive tackle in football. And I don't know if I will argue that, but I mean, feel free because you're you're not making a ridiculous case. And that's important. And we all recognize that. And again, the reason we all already know that is because we can see it. Because he's the guy getting the sacks. He's the guy getting the pressures. Everybody's talking about him. Everybody's doing film breakdowns about him. So we kind of know, right? We know he got off to a slow start. We know he's, he's really ascending. The exact opposite of Rodgers. Obviously, we watch his progress. We watch him every single play. Every time he touches the ball, every single play, he's touching the ball. We're not too busy watching, you know, Billy Turner to say, oh, what, what happened? Did, did he throw it? I didn't see what happened. I was watching Billy Turner there. That doesn't happen. And so what I did yesterday, and by the way, all of this information in full is on Patreon. I did an article yesterday, and I think that's what I'm going to try to do. And I know I say things every day, and then I just don't do 90% of them. So take it with a grain of salt. I'm on the latter end of that millennial spectrum, but I'm on there, so I'm very erratic. My attention span is zero, so I, I still have that attribute. So you're just going to have to deal with me in that regard. However, the the plan is for that essentially to be, I guess, something similar to what The Atlantic is. It's just a paid thing, but you get things like this where you get everybody's... I'm not giving the exact PFF grades because I don't want to do that, but everybody's rank. So, for example, I have Aaron Rodgers' overall rank as a quarterback, his passer rating rank. So just based on his throwing ability, what is his rank? And then I give the PFF grade by terminology as opposed to the exact number. So, for example, Aaron Rodgers is graded as a below-average quarterback, which is really, really bad. Doesn't sound really bad, but there aren't very many quarterbacks that are worse than below average, and that's true with, I think, every position. I'm not sure. There might be like one or two people who actually have, are graded out as bad. But So anyways, I want to kind of go through that. I don't want to do everything and give every single rank because that diminishes the point of everybody that's on Patreon. But again, um, for as little as five bucks a month, I know it's kind of seems like a lot, but 
this is kind of a, a good amount of, of research that went into this. Um, and I gave all the relevant rankings. So for the running backs, I've got their overall, their rushing, their receiving, and then their PFF grade. It's got all their ranks as compared to everybody else. I've got asterisks, asterisks next to the guys that are only on unfiltered lists. So you kind of take it with a grain of salt, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yeah, consider it. Link is in the description. Also, patrons, I don't exactly know what to do all the time. Billy, I know you gave me a suggestion. I forgot what it was. Hit me up with that. I want suggestions because I want to be able to crank out content, but I'm going to need your help in telling me what it is you want to see. So give me some requests and I'll put it up there. Um, not positive this is going to take the whole time. It should. But again, I got to find a way to do this and not uh, talk about everybody and all of the details. So as usual, if you appreciate the show, please leave a five-star iTunes review. If you don't use iTunes, try to leave a review somewhere else. Stitcher, I think you can do it online. It's for everyone. It's not walled off like Apple is. Otherwise, get in the Facebook group. Be sure to like the Facebook page. Again, I apologize for all the bots. As uh, my buddy Blaine said yesterday, they are all drunk because I've got three of them, and they're competing with each other and arguing with each other. And so it's pretty funny, but I've also upset some people because they don't realize that this is a thing, and they get annoyed and leave. <laughs> and I just, I don't, I want you to realize they're, they're broken robots right now. And if you want to have fun and mess with them, be my guest. Otherwise, just ignore them. But if, if you wouldn't mind, actually, do send me a message because then you're kind of opted in. And when these things get fixed, I want to send out some, some cool surveys and polls and whatever else I can think of. So I think that's it. Pack underscore daddy on uh, Twitter. Packernet podcast on Instagram. Should be good. Let's do the drawing now because, again, I'll forget. Ready? Here we go. The number is 428. And the winner this time is Mr. Ben Schrankler. Instagram name, Shrankler B. Big Benny Shrank. Come on down, big man. Please send me a message. Please, please. Somebody message him and tell him he won. I just, I can't take this anymore. Benny boy, got yourself a jersey and stuff. Unless you want the signed picture. Anyways, congrats to Ben. Let's take a break. Folks, if you're still kind of on the fence as far as uh, Christmas, I don't know if you realize this, we got less than a week. And if you don't have a gift... You're, you're kind of in trouble, although, you know, the whole Amazon thing, it can get here quick. But don't, I'm telling you, don't sleep on it. I've played that game before. Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. No, you won't. If you're running out of ideas, you're stuck. Why don't you check out Vivid Seats? Find out what's going on in the area. It doesn't have to be now. It could be something going on in January. It's just, it's, it, it's just the gift that you're giving on the 25th. Jump on there, see what's going on. Maybe you want to buy somebody a, a ticket to a Packer game. Maybe it's to the musical Cats. Don't know why you would do that, but maybe you want to. Please don't buy me that. But if you want to give it to Cousin Jeffrey, go for it. He'll love it. Point is, there's a lot of great gift ideas on there, and it's worth a look just to check it out. So download the Vivid Seats app. See if there's anything on there that interests you or somebody that you appreciate and plan on giving a gift. And as a benefit, you're going to get some rewards back, which you can apply to the next Packer game tickets. They're all backed by the 100% buyer guarantee, and if it's your first time, enter promo code OVERTIME in the Vivid Seats app, and you'll save up to $100 on all ticket purchases. Today's episode of the Packernet Podcast is brought to you by CBS Sports HQ, the brand new streaming sports news network. It's live 24-7 and costs you nothing. That's right, it's sports coverage that's always on and always free. Always. Seriously, though, this is not, uh, this is a really easy sales pitch, because I don't know if you can even call it selling. Because you don't have to pay for anything. Unless you're my wife and you don't have any room on your phone because you take so many pictures and videos and that takes up all the room on your phone despite the fact that we bought a Google phone so that you could just put it all on the cloud for free and it doesn't take up room on your phone but you're scared that it's not going to work and you're going to lose all your photos. And so despite spending the money on the phone, you still don't have room on your phone which is the entire reason for switching phones. Unless you're that person, you should have enough room on your phone. Just download the CBS Sports HQ app. Because there's literally zero reason not to. It's just an app that talks about football all day. And some other sports, too. Yeah, just whip it out, and it's like, boom. What up, sports? And then five minutes later, you take it back out. It's like, hey, what are you doing, CBS Sports HQ? And they're like, oh, just talking about more sports. You want to see what we've been talking about the last five minutes since you've been gone? Here's all the videos. Oh, great, thank you. How about Packers? You want to talk about, yeah, sure. You want to see all the Packers come? Here you go. Here's what we've been talking about with the Packers. Super easy and convenient. Don't have to navigate the garbagepackers.com app that doesn't actually play videos because everything's broken. 
to see what they're talking about. Nope, CBS Sports HQ, just talking football, no big deal. It's a beautiful product, and there's no fake debates, just sports for real sports fans at a great price of completely free. You don't even have to log in or sign up or anything. Just download the CBS Sports app and watch CBS Sports HQ today. All right, so let's talk about it. You already know some of the bad news. And and really, again, if we break it down, Aaron Rodgers being the 30th overall quarterback is broke down by saying that he's had two games that were good, not great, two games that were horrible. That's sort of the full elaborative story. Still not great, and it still is what it is. When Mitch Trubisky was the 30th ranked or 35th ranked ranked quarterback in football, which is really hard to accomplish when you there's 32 teams, but he pulled it off. It wasn't because every single week he was just the worst. It was because he was bad most of the time with a bunch of mediocre and a couple good games mixed in. So at the end of the day, it still is what it is. Over the last four weeks, there are 29 quarterbacks that have performed better than Aaron Rodgers, and that's problematic. Now, there is good news, but it's also somewhat bad news when you look at people that maybe are better than we would have expected or who we could possibly say are ascending. However, one of the biggest descending players is our quarterback and also Mr. You know, guys like Devontae. And that's what needs to turn around. But the encouraging thing is, when you look at the guys that are ascending and you realize, hey, if, if we can get some of these guys to come back and turn this bad boy around, we could be right back on track. So let's let's go through this. We'll go position by position. And um, again, I'm not going to give it all away. You've got to go on Patreon, five bucks to, to see this. And also I've got the big board uploaded for the NFL draft, 300 and some odd prospects aggregated down from 22 different um, big boards from around the web. It's worth it, man, I'm telling you. But looking at running back, again, the, the perception is Aaron Jones is probably the best running back in football. Maybe that's not the perception, but from Packer fans, he's top five, right? Jamal's right up there. Overall, over the last four weeks, Aaron Jones is ranked 20th out of 60. Jamal is 44th out of 60. Now, Aaron Jones is a better receiver overall, kind of. I mean, it's, it's, it's a smaller number because it's out of 39 because not every running back is a back that catches footballs. But the problem is there was a point in time when Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams were like number two and number three in receiving behind Christian McCaffrey. Right now, Aaron Jones is 14th, Jamal Williams is 22nd. So there's no question this is not the same kind of production. Now, Aaron Jones obviously has some really big games, but Aaron Jones is following the Packers' tradition of being really, really good a lot of the time and then having kind of just terrible games sometimes. That lack of consistency, which granted, most players have a lack of consistency. But still, what is the point of looking at a rank? There are 19 other players who lack consistency, but are consistent enough to be better than Aaron Jones over the last four weeks. And although the 49ers and the Bears defenses were mixed in, let's not forget the Giants and the Redskins defenses were also there. So it kind of evens out. So I'm not complaining, but again, the point is, where are the arrows pointing? And to also course correct on what everybody thinks, which is that Aaron Jones is top five, and as a receiver, he's like one of the top two receiving backs in co- in football. Well, not since the bye, no. And so the overall grade for Aaron Jones would be good. The overall grade for Jamal Williams is an average running back. By the way, I also have these put in order of best to worst. So, for example, when we go to wide receiver, our number one wide receiver, highest graded overall grade wide receiver, he's got an asterisk next to his name because of the smaller sample size, but it's Jay Kumaro. He is our highest graded receiver, and it's not because he's an elite player. His overall grade is just good, which means it's in the 70s, which is not a good thing. It's not like, dude, Jay Kumaro's so good. No, I mean, he's fine. And that's why he's going to be getting more opportunities. LaFleur has said numerous times now, Kumaro's going to be getting more opportunities. And I'm listen, I'm excited about it. I like Jay Kumaro. And again, I think we should just run with whatever's hot, and Jay Kumaro seems to be the hot hand right now. So run with it. And then if he's having a bad day, let's just take him off the field, put somebody else in, find out who has the hot hand, and run with that. I'm not anti-Kumaro. I just want to be realistic about this. So over the last four weeks, out of 169 wide receivers, because again, I had to remove all the filters, which means if you even had one target over the last four weeks, you're on this list. But he is 40th out of 169 wide receivers, which is pretty solid. He's got an overall grade of that's just good, as I said. Second is Devontae, who unfortunately over the last four weeks is graded out as average. Now, I understand the guy's got a toe issue, and I have to assume that's affecting him because he was the entire year a top five wide receiver 
He went out with an injury, came back, and now he's an average wide receiver, 34th out of 95 wide receivers. That's about as average as you can get. He's not even in the top 32. That's problematic. So it's very common for the narrative to be that we've got Devontae and nobody else. The problem is over the last four weeks, when we've really been noticing these problems, we don't have a number one wide receiver. That's a problem. Now, I'm, I'm kind of speaking, I don't want to take these ranks too far. I know that's somewhat blasphemous what I just said, but it is what it is. A number one wide receiver is somebody that's at least top 32. Devontae's not that over the last four weeks. And, and listen, don't act like you haven't seen it. Where's Devontae been? It's not just the touchdowns, it's the yards, it's the receptions, and then last week the guy couldn't catch a single pass. Which, by the way, um, your toe hurt has nothing to do with catching footballs, right? You, you can't quite get open, fine, whatever, but when you're open and the ball hits you in the hands and you drop it, that's not a toe issue. So, again, problematic. Because there are areas, especially along the defense, the defense over the last four weeks, ho oh, the offense, though, it's like, what is this? Aaron Rodgers, just one of the worst over the last four weeks, literally, one of the worst quarterbacks in football. There's only 32 teams. He's ranked 30th. I mean, what? I don't know what else you want me to say about it. Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams are basically run-of-the-mill running backs, again, based on their rank. And our best receiver is Jay Kumaro, who's just kind of, he caught that one pass, right? The next best would be Alan Lazard. Alan Lazard is average. Obviously, he's very streaky, so he has really good games, and then he just disappears. Sometimes he's like the guy that the other team doesn't have an answer for. Other days, he doesn't really do much except be a really big tight end that plays wide receiver and blocks corners and just blocks them right into the dirt, which is great, but, you know, the running routes and catching passes thing is more important. Um, After that is Geronimo Allison. His receiving grade right now is 91st out of 95. He's literally one of the worst wide receivers in football. And that's with the filter on, right? In other words, only people that are playing with some regularity and are being targeted with some regularity, he's about as bad as it gets. Unfortunately, there's somebody who's even worse somehow, and his name is Marquez Valdez-Scantling. He has not been playing enough to even be on the list of guys with a lot of targets. He has an asterisk next to his name because he's not being targeted, because he's not a very good wide receiver, or at least hasn't been. Out of 169 wide receivers who have had the ball thrown at them at least once. Remember, 169. We're talking (laughs) almost, we're closing in on almost 200 human beings. Marquez Valdez-Scantling over the last four weeks ranks 165th. Out of every person who's just stood out wide, he is arguably the worst in all of football. I mean, the, the... The quarterback wide receiver situation is such a mess, it's just, it's disturbing. It's got to be fixed, man. And by the way, I've been talking about, and we'll do this more tomorrow, I I did this, I got ahead of it. Maybe this is what I'll work on today. Again, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. There's also a link. I'm going to do this exact same exercise, but for the Minnesota Vikings. What have they been doing over the last four weeks? I already got started because I wanted to see. I didn't put it in print or anything yet. The whole thing about them having garbage corners, not so much anymore, right? You heard how Xavier Rhodes is getting benched, basically. And it's like, oh, man, they're so bad. They're benching Xavier because he's trash, which is kind of true. But it's also true over the last four weeks. They've got guys that have stepped up to such a degree. Xavier Rhodes serves no purpose. The corners have stepped up in a massive way. Now, other people have kind of stepped back. The, uh, you know, Everson Griffin has not been good the second half of the year. Things of that nature, but... Dude, they've got probably the best safety duo in football. They've got two corners right now that are playing really good football over the last four weeks at least. Our ability to throw the ball, and by the way, with with um, Daniil Hunter, who's still a very, very good pass rusher, I you know, they got to figure something out because this is one of the best defensive back groups in football right now with a really good pass rusher that's not going to let Rodgers sit back and try to find something. So they, they've got to figure something out fast if they're going to be able to move the ball down the field. Anyways, that's for tomorrow. So that's the wide receiver group. It's um, Jake Kumro, who's really small sample size, but is the only guy over the last four weeks that's even slightly competent. Devontae, well, I shouldn't say that. Who's, who's, I guess you could say good. Devontae is an average wide receiver. Alan Lazard is an average wide receiver. Geronimo and Marquez are two of the worst wide receivers in football. That's our wide receiver group right now. Since the bye week. 
since we've all been sitting around saying, what is going on? Since we got annihilated by the 49ers, since we beat the Giants but went, I don't know, it didn't feel right. Since we beat the Washington Redskins and started pouting and said that was terrible. And since we did the exact same thing with the Bears, where basically they looked great, and then the second half the offense couldn't even get a first down. This is the problem. Let's move on to tight end now. The number one graded um, tight end, and by the way, the only person that actually made it with the filter, in other words, they've been playing enough to be filtered, was Jimmy Graham. But our number one wide receiver right now is Mercedes Lewis. And it's actually kind of close. Mercedes is 29th. Actually, it's, it's not that close, because this is out of 86, whereas Jimmy Graham's out of 39. So Jimmy's actually relatively low. But he's 29th out of 86. Now, as a receiver, Mercedes Lewis is terrible. He's 70th out of 86, but he is arguably the best blocking tight end in football. And I know some of you are going to say, well, duh, we already knew that about Mercedes Lewis. Everybody already knows he's a great blocker. No, that's false. He was terrible as a blocker in 2018. I don't know that he was that good of a blocker in the first half of the year. Second half of the year, though, he is absolutely tearing it up. So when you look at tight ends that are blocking, there are 104 tight ends. Out of 104 tight ends, Mercedes Lewis is 6th in pass blocking, ninth in run blocking. He's top 10 in both categories. That's massive. That's really, really helpful to be able to help the offensive block, uh, offensive line block so that Aaron Rodgers has more time to throw, to be able to help spring Aaron Jones. To have a tight end that can do that is huge. Now, we need somebody that can run routes and catch passes. We don't have that which is unfortunate because we don't have wide receivers that can do that either. And we don't have a quarterback that seems to be able to throw the ball over the last four weeks. So that whole process is problematic. And also our running backs have fallen off the last four weeks as far as receivers. But at least having Mercedes Lewis be able to block and at such a ridiculously high level is awesome. Now, overall, he's graded as an average tight end because, again, as a receiver, he's pretty bad. But I'll 100% take that, because the fact of the matter is that's why we brought in Mercedes Lewis, because he's one of the best blockers in football, and over the last four weeks, he is again. He is, at the age of 36 or however old he is, the best blocking tight end in football. That's awesome. If I'm going to if I'm gonna rip on Rodgers for being the worst quarterback, which, again, small sample size, and it's only really been two games, but still, we're, we're, we're doing this exercise, this is what we're doing, then I'm going to give Mercedes Lewis credit for being the best blocking tight end in football. That's what it is. Uh, Jimmy Graham. He's not a good receiver, um, terrible run blocker. However, his best attribute has been pass blocking. There's been a little bit of highlighting that. He's always been underrated as a blocker since he came to Green Bay. Everybody's whole narrative is he's a good receiver, but he's a terrible blocker. And then they show clips on Twitter. Look, here's him trying to block, and he's terrible, and that's true. The problem is they don't show the other times when he actually does a pretty good job. Um, and that's part of the reason that I've been saying Mercedes hasn't been that good because a lot of the time, at least half the time, Jimmy Graham has been a better blocker than Mercedes Lewis. Now, that's not the case now, but even now, he's 34th out of 72 as a pass blocker. That's not great. That's still not super fantastic, but compare that to him being 30th out of 39 as a receiver. So I guess technically sort of one of the worst. And then as a run blocker, 67th out of 72, he's graded as a below average tight end, which I would just like to remind you all, this man is paid more than any other tight end in football. $250,000 more than Travis Kelsey. That's just wild to me. Um, after that is Jay Sternberger, uh, very similar to Jimmy Graham, actually, just to a much worse degree. Out of 86 tight ends, he's ranked 71st uh, as a receiver, 76th out of 87, run blocker, 62nd out of 104. Pass blocker, however, he actually kind of shines, 35th out of 104 total tight end. So he's actually doing that pretty well, and I really think as a receiver that's going to take a step up because I've we, we've all seen the, the clips of him getting open and Rodgers just not throwing to him. He's got the kind of speed and athleticism to really burn some tight ends or some uh, linebackers in certain situations. I just think Rodgers isn't looking that way, whether it's just the design or if he just believes somebody else is going to be open or he doesn't trust Jace. I don't know exactly what the situation is, but um, one of these days he's going to be looking and he's going to hit him for a big play. But overall, he's graded as a bad um, tight end. Below him is Robert Tanya. Very similar situation. Bad receiver, bad run blocker, pretty good pass blocker. Actually higher than uh, anybody but Mercedes. He's 20th out of 104. So all the tight ends have been pass blocking really, really well. None of them have done anything else other than Mercedes as a run blocker. And obviously, he's graded as bad as well. Offensive line, the highest graded offensive lineman. Probably not super surprising for a lot of you. Brian Balaga. Overall, he's ranked 5th out of all uh, tackles. David Bakhtiari is ranked 20th, which is probably shocking to a lot of people. Again, 
He's a really good pass blocker. He has a, a much higher grade than Brian Balaga as a pass blocker, but his run blocking is just really bad. Whereas Brian Balaga, shockingly, is actually the eighth highest graded run blocker in football. He has a very good grade. I think he's the first very good grade that we've seen. Um, pass blocking, 23rd out of 79, which is still a good grade. It doesn't sound very good, but if you just look at the actual numbers, it, he's graded out fairly well. Um, and he's also going up against some really tough competition. So he's doing that despite going up against guys like Khalil Mack all day long. So some great tackles. Um, I also put Alex Light on this list because he actually made the cut as far as being filtered. But uh, overall, 65th out of 79. Better run blocker than a pass blocker. He's 71st out of 79 as a pass blocker. Looking at guards, somewhat surprisingly over the last four weeks, Billy Turner is actually higher than Elton Jenkins, and by a pretty good margin. Elton Jenkins is 34th out of 76. Billy Turner is 24th. Now, Elton Jenkins is a mile ahead of Billy Turner as a pass blocker, which is probably why Billy Turner gets beat up on so much. Because people care about pass blocking a lot more, and you can see sacks. You can't really see unless you go back and rewatch and everything the, the run blocking. Plus the statistics, who gives up the most pressures. Billy Turner gives up a billion pressures. Elton Jenkins does not, so it, it looks worse. But overall grade, Billy Turner, 65th out of 76 pass blockers. He's really, really bad. But as a run blocker, 13th out of 76. He's really done a great job um, of springing Aaron Jones. Elton Jenkins... 17th, as I said, as a pass blocker, 34th as a run blocker out of 76. So even that, not super terrible, I guess. But both of these guys graded out as average guards. And then I got uh, Corey Lindsley out of here, on here out of 33 centers, 10th overall, 12th in pass blocking, 10th in run blocking, overall grade of good. So that's the offense. It's not super great. Um, there's There's not a whole lot of great news other than, you know, the tackles are doing a good job. Bakhtiari, maybe not quite as good as he's been in the past, even, you know, eighth overall as a pass blocker. I hate to even complain about that because it's awesome, but typically Bakhtiari's top three automatic and is a lot of times just even overall, despite being a bad run blocker, still the best tackle in football. He's not right now, but, it, you know, he's fine. Um, you know, Billy Turner is a good run blocker. I'm trying to find some silver lining here. There's just not a lot. I, you know, uh, Mercedes being the best blocker in uh, – of all tight ends is probably the best news I got out of the offense. So the offense, which shouldn't surprise a lot of people, not a lot of great news. Not a lot of great news. We know the potential's there, at least insofar as Aaron Jones, Jamal Williams, Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams. We at least know those guys should be playing better. And if they do, that's all we really need. If we can just get them back up to what they normally do, I, I think the team is relatively unstoppable. But they're not right now, so we'll see how it goes. Why don't we take a break? We'll come back and look at defense and a little bit at special teams, and then we'll call her a day. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. 
So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. All right, so typically how I like to run this is from the inside out, so defensive tackle, edge, linebacker, corner, safety. And so we're starting smack dab in the middle um, with defensive interior. The top guy, obviously, is Kenny Clark. That actually hasn't been the case all year. To start, there have been defensive tackles just on the Packers that have been graded higher than Kenny Clark. Over the last four weeks, it's not really even close. Now, his run defense is getting better, but over the last four weeks even, if you zoom out even that much, he's 66th out of 121. So that's the one area that needs to improve, and if it does, there's no question he's going to be the top defensive tackle in football, if it continues to improve, I should say, because it already has gotten better starting with this past week. But despite being 66th against a run, he's still the ninth overall highest graded um, defensive tackle. Why? Because as a pass rusher, he has the highest grade of any defensive tackle. That includes guys like Aaron Donald, by the way. Better pass rusher than Aaron Donald over the last four weeks. He's tied for the most sacks of any defensive tackle over the last four weeks with four. He's tied with Matt Ioannidis, he's tied with uh, Ed Oliver, and he's tied with Aaron Donald. All four of those guys have four sacks. I think he has. he's tied for the second highest most pressures of any defensive tackle over the last four weeks. So as a pass rusher, he, which is what we really need. I know we need people to help defend the run and do a better job in that regard. But getting Kenny Clark after the quarterback is is the most important thing that this defense has needed for a long time, and it's coming. Other than that, not a huge amount of great news as far as defensive tackles. Dean Lowry is the second highest. Um, He's got a good grade. He's doing fine. Run defense is, I guess, kind of good, not great. Pass rush, good, not great. Tyler Lancaster, um, obviously a better run defender than anything. Uh, He's graded out overall as average. But as a pass rusher, he's 102 out of 121. He's providing nothing, but I think we know that going in. He's just a big hulking bag of mashed potatoes, man, just hanging out waiting to smash somebody. So run defense, 50th out of 121. That's just kind of his jam. Beneath that, Montrevious Adams, he's got an asterisk next to his name. 131st out of 169. Um, Slightly better pass rusher than run defender, but not really good in either category. Overall grade below average. And then Kingsley Kiki is the lowest, um, one of the worst run-defending defensive tackles in all of football. However, a glimmer of hope as a pass rusher, 79th out of 169, but overall still his grade is bad. He's obviously a very raw player that's going to need some work, and hopefully he can at least figure out something. Right, Even if he's just the worst run defender, if he can just come in like on third and long situations to spell a guy, which I don't really want him out there in third and long, we need guys that are better. But if we need him, if he could just be a, a decent enough pass rusher, that'd be great. At least for now, you know, give him some time to work this whole thing out. And he's not getting a lot of opportunities. That brings us over to edge rushers. Um, some good news, some maybe not super exciting news. But obviously, Zadarius is just the man amongst men. Um, now, to be clear, he's always been really good statistic-wise, but overall grade, PFF hasn't really given him that much love as far as grades. That's no longer the case. He is currently the third highest graded pass rusher in all of football out of 115 pass rushers. That's unbelievable. Even more shocking, he has a better grade against the run than he does as a pass rusher. He is the 15th best pass rusher, the 7th best run defending edge rusher. So he has just stepped up in every possible conceivable way. He's technically got a very good grade, but it is bordering on elite. I think it's like 88.5 or something like that. The second highest graded edge rusher, probably going to set a lot of people off, is what it is. It's Rashawn Gary. And no, this, no, there's no asterisk here. He has enough pressures over the last four weeks to stand on his own merit. Out of 115 pass rushers, he's 64th. That's not super great. However, you may have noticed I didn't mention Preston Smith because he's one spot higher than Preston Smith, which says more about Preston Smith falling than anything else, which is kind of problematic. So as much as I want to give Rashawn a pat on the back, and I do, it's more about, come on, Preston, please, please don't fall off here. But uh, not super surprisingly, well, maybe it is a little surprising, actually. Rashawn Gary has a much higher pass rush grade than he has run defense grade. I think that was actually the exact opposite of what most would expect. 85th out of 115 against the run, 28th best pass rusher out of 115, which by my metric technically would make him a starting number one pass rusher. Not a very good number one, but he's inside the top 32. Preston Smith, one spot behind him. Rashawn was 64th. Uh, Preston is 65th. 
He comes at it from the opposite perspective, a better run defender than a pass rusher, which is what he was in Washington. Um, he obviously got off to a really hot start as a pass rusher early on in the year. Um, that seems to be falling off, and the, the biggest reason that scares me is because it kind of looks like a regression to the mean kind of thing. In other words, Preston and Zadarius are both playing completely out of their mind and are way, way, way higher than they've ever done before. And similar to what I said about the Bears' defense, where it's somewhat unsustainable, and I don't think that's going to stay that way, Zadarius is, is staying that way. Preston seems to be slipping, and he's having a hard time holding on to that level of production. So hopefully it's just the last four weeks have been a little bit of a fluke, and he's going to be right back on top. But Preston has somewhat disappeared over the last um, over the last four weeks, to the, to the degree of being 65th, which is outside of even being a number two. Right? If you're a number one, you're in the top 32. If you're a number two, you're in the top 64, which Rashawn Gary just makes that list, and Preston Smith is technically outside of it. So that that's not great. And then the biggest shocker has been Kyler Fackrell. Um, almost entirely because of his last two weeks, he's been one of the worst pass rushers over the last two weeks. And again, I, I probably cursed the guy because I just started talking him up, and then two weeks in a row after I say it, he just completely falls off. But out of 115 pass rushers, he's ranked 97th and is pretty close to being as bad in both categories, but actually is worse as a pass rusher, 100th out of 115. That's just uh, it's kind of terrible. Looking at the linebackers, um, probably surprising to some, Blake Martinez is our highest-graded uh, linebacker. Not super surprising to some. He's better in coverage than he is as a run defender. Now, there's, there's this misconception, and somebody even put in the, the Facebook group that PFF said he was the best coverage linebacker in college. I didn't see that. I don't really know, but that's been the case the last two years he's been in Green Bay. He's been a better coverage linebacker than he has been a run defender, and it's not necessarily because he's terrible in coverage. He actually, last year, was one of the better coverage linebackers in the NFL, which is a lot harder to do than doing it in college, and he's kind of doing it again this year. The biggest problem is that his complete lack of ability to play against the run, 65th out of 87 linebackers is what he does um, against the run. He's 25th out of 87 in coverage, overall grade just average. B.J. Goodson and Oren Burks both have asterisks next to their name, so it's out of 139 linebackers. Um, B.J. Goodson actually very, very good in coverage, 13th out of 139 in coverage, but uh, terrible against the run, which is the exact opposite of what everybody thought because that's the opposite of what he's done over the course of his career. Overall grade is average. Oren Burks, um, literally one of the worst linebackers in football, and I want to put emphasis on that because there's still some who just don't listen and think if we just gave him our opportunities, he's really, really good. He's really, really athletic. He's probably really good in coverage. False. He's better against the run than he is in coverage. He is 67th out of 139 against the run. He is 128th out of 139 in coverage. He is 137th out of 139. He is the third worst linebacker in all of football over the last four weeks. No bueno. Um, corners. Now, something to keep in mind here, uh, Chandon Sullivan and Josh Jackson are actually listed as safeties via PFF. That's because of their snap counts. They spend more time playing safety, actually, than they do playing corner. If you'd like a breakdown on that, maybe I could do that. Maybe that's something else I'll do for PFF is sort of a snap counts breakdown, where people line up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't know. But that really just leaves three corners. Now, that's not to say that these guys haven't played corner, because obviously they have. But true corners, guys that just play corner or most of the time, Jair, Tremont, and Kevin King, and that's the order that they're in. Now, unfortunately, none of this is overly impressive. The best corner is Jair, and he's ranked 29th out of 118, which, to be honest, is about where he was last year. He was around 29th, which is to say technically starter caliber, but not by much. So this is the second year in a row where he's been kind of around that range. Um, coverage, 37th out of 118. Uh, overall, good, not great. Tremont Williams has fallen off a bit, but I really think a lot of it has to do with that week that he played on the outside, which really wasn't his thing and really kind of hurt him. And again, that's the problem with looking at four weeks is it's a smaller sample size. So one really bad game is going to throw this all off. But overall, 65th out of 118, 51st overall in coverage and uh, an average overall grade. Kevin King, 83rd out of 118, 78th in coverage out of 118 overall grade is below average. So Jair's good, Tremont's average, Kevin King's below average. Looking at safeties, some of who happen to play corner a good portion of the time, our top guy is Adrian Amos. He's playing really, really well the last four weeks. He is the eighth highest graded safety in all of football out of 82. His best asset is coverage. Run defense, although it's seemingly been pretty good, is mediocre overall. In coverage, however, seventh out of 82. 
Second is Josh Jackson, who does have an asterisk next to his name. But um, as we've all seen, really played well over the last four weeks. Out of 133 corners, he ranks 25th, which is incredibly impressive because we're talking about, again, guys that have played as little as one snap. So some of these guys are way overinflated. They might be like the fifth best corner, despite the fact that they've done almost nothing. So if you were to adequately filter this, he's probably even higher than 25th. Um, his best as- attribute is coverage, run defense, similar to Amos, is not actually that great. But 19th out of 133 in coverage, super excited to see that. I, I actually think part of the-, the issue here with Josh Jackson, the Packers have been playing a lot of zone lately. Josh Jackson was never, ever, ever a press man cover guy in college. When he was super good in college, he played zone, and he just read the quarterback, and he just had a knack for the ball. I think if the Packers are going to continue to play in a lot of zone, even if it's maybe just toward the end of the game when we're just trying to play prevent and stay ahead of the game, I don't think it would be that terrible of an idea to throw Josh Jackson out there. If you're just going to have guys sit back in zone, Josh Jackson could potentially be our best corner on, on the team, and that's that's not hyperbole. There was talk in the draft that Josh Jackson was a better corner than Jair. That was the thought process. We ended up taking Jair, thinking we were going to t- take Josh Jackson in that spot. The only reason we t- took Josh Jackson in the, in the second is because it was like, there's no way this guy belongs in the second. He's easily a first-round corner. And again, my, my whole hypothesis has been he just doesn't fit this scheme. But again, the Packers have been playing a ton of zone. I think we should play him more. Even if it's just when we're playing zone. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, if we're going to play man, keep Kevin King out there. If we're playing zone... Pull King, well, maybe he's good in zone too. I don't really know. But put Josh Jackson out there. I want to know. Because, again, it's possible he's one of our, he might be our best corner when we're playing zone. It's just a hypothesis. I'm just putting it out there. But I'd really like to know the answer to that question because I, I, I do think he's a good corner. I, and I'm worried that what's going to happen is we're not going to play him because we're going to be so dogmatic about this scheme, which obviously we're not anymore. We're going to end up getting rid of him. He's going to go to a place where he actually fits, where they play mostly zone, and he's just going to be dominant, like we've seen with several DBs that go somewhere and play where they belong. Demarius going to play safety. Hyde going to play safety. I mean, Demarius isn't exactly elite, but Hyde is, and Demarius is heads and tails better than he was here, playing as a man corner. Actually played a lot of zone, but whatever. So, I, I don't know. I'd like to see it. And it is a small sample size, and I don't want to be one of those people that gets hyped up over a limited picture. But I am a little bit. Because there's a difference between getting hyped up about Jay Kumaro and Josh Jackson. One of these guys was legitimately a first-round contender. A guy that could have easily gone in the first round. The other guy is a guy that, I mean, didn't even get drafted. And I know things happen, and sometimes undrafted guys are really good, and sometimes first-round, second-round guys are busts. Happens all the time, but... There's no question there's a difference in talent, and it wouldn't shock me that much if it turns out Josh Jackson's actually a good football player. So, anyways, moving on. I really want him to be a good football player, man. Uh, Third would be Darnell Savage, who's actually still doing a very good job, despite being third. He's the 13th highest graded safety in football, which goes to show how high 25th out of 133 is. It's higher when you equivocate it to 13th overall. So Adrian Amos is 8th then Josh Jackson, then Darnell Savage is 13th. That's how good these guys have been over the last four weeks. Once again, run defense, Darnell's not doing a huge um, amount of good. 70th out of 82, but in coverage, 13th out of 82. So Amos is 7th, then Josh Jackson is 19th out of 133, then Darnell Savage is 13th out of 82. These guys have been dominant in coverage, and that's awesome because we absolutely need that. Uh, next up would be Chandon Sullivan, again, another guy that we generally see as a corner, but I think he's one of those sort of hybrid safety slash slot guys, kind of like a Minka Fitzpatrick, just, you know, not as good, but still like that whole thing. Play safety, sometimes drop into the slot. But even Chandon is technically top 32. He's 31st out of 82, which is incredible. So we've got four guys that are in the top 32 in terms of talent. Now he's better in coverage than against the run, but he's a little bit more evenly distributed. Overall, still considered a good um, football player. That's his, his his grade. So Amos was very good. Josh Jackson, Darnell Savage, and Chandon Sullivan were all good. And then finally, last on this list is Ibrahim Campbell. Unfortunately, he has fallen off entirely in run defense. He's actually the worst run defending safety we have on this team, including two of the guys who are kind of like corners. Um, over the last four weeks, 64th out of 82 against the run, which is his whole thing. Now, in coverage, he hasn't been that bad, 45th out of 82, but that's not really his thing. If he was 45th out of 82 in coverage and was like 12th against the run, that would be awesome. The problem is his main attribute he's been really terrible at. So overall, he's 59th out of 82, 
just not really doing as well as, as we had hoped. Again, smaller sample size. He's still got some talent. He still can contribute in certain situations, but we haven't really seen what it is we've been hoping and wanting to see from Ibrahim Campbell. Uh, finally, let's look at a little bit of special teams. J.K. Scott obviously um, has not been super great the last few weeks, which is really disappointing because I really like J.K. Scott. I really want him to succeed. He has a huge amount of talent, and it's frustrating when a guy who's really good at doing one thing, and I, I don't want to say one simple thing because I don't think it's simple, but it's like you do one thing, and you're really good at that one thing, and you have nothing to do with your life except perfect that one thing. So that when game time comes, you do that one thing really well, and then you just don't do it for four straight weeks. It's like, how does that even happen? I don't understand what that even means. It's not like quarterback where when you get the ball, you have a lot of things going on. It's not just a matter of can you throw this ball accurately. There's a lot of other mental processing, making decisions, right, timing, all this stuff going on. Your job is to catch it and kick it. That's it. And a lot of times, it's really just kick it as hard as you can. Right? If we're punting from our own 10-yard line, not a whole lot of strategy. It might be left, it might be right, but I mean, it's really just, I'm, I, you know, it's sort of like a quarterback workout. Punting is like a, a, an all-time quarterback workout where you know the route and there's no defenders. It's just your buddy running a route and you got to throw it to him. You know where he's running and you just got to hit him. That's what punting is. And if you're a good punter or if you're a good quarterback, you should be able to dominate these quarterback workouts, which is why most quarterbacks dominate quarterback workouts because they're kind of a joke because it's not a real life situation. But anyway, I don't know, whatever. It's just, it's a, it's a frustrating thing. He's 26th out of 32, one of the worst punters in football. Overall grade is below average. Mason Crosby as a field goal kicker, because that's really all I care about. I don't really care about his grade as a kickoff kicker. Seventh out of 34, so he's doing a fantastic job. Overall grade is good. And then finally, um, our kick returner, Tyler Irvin. Overall grade is fifth out of 54 return men, sixth as a punt returner out of 54, and the second highest graded kick returner in football overall grade is good. Small sample size again, but super exciting that he's able to do what he's able to do. And another guy that I just completely jinxed, but in a good way, because he came over here and it's like, well, I mean, he's not going to do anything. It's just a random guy we picked up off the street who has some ability to catch a ball and when we got to dump another guy. So I will do nothing but talk trash about people for the remainder of however long. Just Tell me who you want to do well, and I will come on here and just trash them. As a matter of fact, Aaron Rodgers is trash. 30th overall, probably burned out. Uh, tank for two of the whole nine yard. Might as well just tank for Fromm, although we don't need to tank to do that, just because, I mean, even Fromm is going to be better than Aaron Rodgers. Obviously, all this is, is fake. I'm just I'm trying to do the magic thing, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to will him into being better by saying he's bad, because I have that kind of magic, and I'm just that superstitious. But anyways, that's it. Again, this is over the last four weeks. This is just to give us a little bit of context so that we know going forward where people are actually at as opposed to just thinking back to what they were in 2018 and assuming that's the exact same thing. This is where we've been since the bye week. This is the team, right? And I know we have a larger context like, oh, come on, Aaron Rodgers isn't that bad. This is what it is, right? Whether we like it or not or whatever, this is what it is. These are, you know, what are the problems? These are the problems. What, what's going right? This is what's going right. Zadarius and, and Kenny Clark, that's what's going right. Obviously, things will fluctuate, can fluctuate, but the, the question is, what needs to change? This is what needs to change. This is the team since the bye week. This is what we've watched for the last four weeks. It's not a team that we're used to. It's not a team that we're accustomed to. It seems ridiculous to think we're a team that has a pretty solid defense, good safeties, great... It's, it's, it's almost the exact opposite of what 2018 was. Well, we got some good pass rushers, we got some good safeties... Just wish we had a quarterback, you know? Exact opposite of any Packers team I've ever been aware of. But anyways, point is, the next four weeks, we need certain guys to continue ascending. We need other guys to go back to what they were in week one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever it was that, that you know, they were at their best. Aaron Jones, we know he's better than 20th. Aaron Rodgers, we obviously know he's better than 27th or whatever he is. Right? We know this. We just need to see it, and it kind of needs to start this Sunday. Excuse me, Monday. It has to, but again, tomorrow the plan will be, we'll see how it goes. We're going to do this exact same thing with the Minnesota Vikings to find out not the team that has been the entire year, but what team we can expect to see on Monday. But anyways, you folks have yourselves a fantastic, what is it, Thursday? Is it Thursday already? All right. You have yourselves a fantastic Thursday. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.